Welcome to Mariner's Church. We are so glad that you are here and I love every week that we come together and gather to lift our voices in praise and learn from God's word. And my prayer today is that your heart would be encouraged, your spirit would be uplifted, and you would know how much the Lord loves you. Let's worship together now.
I love that song. I am so glad that we are able to gather together and sing and worship together. As you know, I typically don't read something that I'm going to share with you, but in this situation, words matter so much, and I wanna be precise. So I've written down what I'm gonna share, and then I'm gonna invite us to pray together. We believe the scripture is clear that God places his image on all people. We have a deep dive course coming up called Deep Dive, the Image of God, where we teach that his image is placed on every ethnicity, on the vulnerable among us, and even on our enemies. We also believe that the image of God is placed on people in their mother's wombs. Psalm 139 is filled with incredible language about God knitting us together. He wonderfully and carefully makes people. Our earthly parents may not have planned us, but God planned each of us. You, he planned you, and you were created in his image. When we speak of justice as a church, we speak of treating people rightly as image bearers of God. We should care for the vulnerable among us, those without a voice, those who cannot defend themselves. And we want the unborn to be treated as image bearers. Abortion is an attack on the image of God. Right now, the Supreme Court is deliberating a case that could bring justice to the unborn. We should pray that God uses the systems of this country to bring justice to the image bearers of God. That's why I'm praying that the Supreme Court will side with the unborn. I know that this is a massively complicated issue. We must not only care about laws surrounding care for the unborn, but we, we must also care for impoverished communities where women and families feel trapped. We must rally around foster families. We must lift up the beauty of the exceptional kids that God brings into our lives. We must provide support and care for young mothers. One of the reasons I'm so proud of you, Mariners Church, is because you care for all of these. You care for impoverished communities. You rally around foster families. You partner with nonprofits like Fristers, a ministry that was birthed from our church, which walks alongside young mothers. I also know that this is a really painful issue for some of you. Some of my close friends, both men and women, have carried deep pain in their lives because of this. One of the reasons I'm against abortion is because of the pain I have seen it bring to people that I love. And I want you to know that God's grace is bigger than any choice you have ever made. You do not have to carry shame or guilt because Jesus carried shame and guilt to the cross for you. And if you've struggled over this, we have people from our care team who would love to pray with you. You can text CARE to the number on the screen. Also, if you want to get involved in serving in impoverished communities and the other ways I've mentioned, you can text CARE to the number on the screen. And if you want to sign up for Deep Dive, The Image of God, where we're going to teach the image of God on all of these, you can also text as well. Will you, will you pray with me about this issue? God, you are the giver of life. We ask that you turn the hearts of our national leaders to care for the unborn who cannot speak for themselves or defend themselves. We ask you to use the Supreme Court to help unborn children be treated rightly in our country. We pray for men and women who carry pain, that they may sense in this moment how deep and wide your love for them is. Amen.
Amen. I love worshiping with you online, and I love as our online congregation that we get to come just as we are from wherever we are. So if you're watching with us live, say hi in the chat. It's incredible to see the reflections, the comments, the community that gets formed just through our messages. And we're also here to connect and pray with you one-on-one. -on -one. And as with Mariners, we love community and providing opportunities to connect online. Next month, we have our Welcome to Mariners class as well as our deep dive courses starting. So go to marinerschurch.org to learn more. And I'm really grateful for the series that we're in called Start With The Ending. All of the past messages you can also find on our website, but for today, let's jump into God's word together and continue learning about what happens in the end. One of the things that's always impressed us about Mariner's Church is their ability to create a variety of access points for people of different levels. I think right now we really enjoy the outdoor space because we've gotten to know some familiar faces. I think we've always found that nature is just a mirror of God's goodness to us. And as we hear the messages of truth and of love, we are surrounded by what he's created for us. We just see that and sense that we have a good God. The fact that they're creating these spaces and designing extra places for people to be and to meet in a variety of settings, it just makes this campus so amazing how versatile it is and how accessible it is uh, to chase after your relationship with God. In 2020, uh, I was struggling a lot with school and like a lot of anxiety and stuff. And I just felt so much better like as soon as I started coming to life groups again. I would tell them uh, about like what was happening in my life and they would pray for me, not just at life groups, but throughout the week. It just made my life do a full 180 and just go back on the right path. I think constantly being around the people that go to my church has really shaped my high school experience. It's just so awesome and we just meet in a big circle and it's just a huge community and we love each other and we're always there for each other, but we keep each other accountable and that's our main focus. Hey, I love that video. I love where God is taking us as a church. Last week I shared that we're gonna to continue to see the gospel, the word of Jesus multiply digitally, and you are a part of that, so welcome to Mariners Online. But if you notice in that video, we also have some renderings of things that are gonna be taking place at Mariners Irvine, as we're gonna see disciples multiplied here. We're gonna have more opportunities for people to get connected into groups where they can really be in community, and become more and more like Jesus. So if Mariners Irvine has been your place, I mean, maybe you watch digitally, but you also attend physically. And even if you were watching from around the world or one of the 50 states here in the US, I wanna share with you where we are headed as a church and, and how we're adjusting some of our facilities and some of our strategy to really join Jesus where he's at work. And so if you will text RSVP to the number on the screen, you can come to one of our gatherings where I'm sharing information with you. You can come physically or you can uh, join us via Zoom, but I would love for you to be a part. All right, this week we're going to look at the ending for those of us who belong to Jesus, the ending in heaven. Three and a half years ago, I moved my family here to Southern California and I had brought Kay out to Southern California for our 20 year anniversary. So she had been here, but just once. Eden, my oldest daughter, had come out to Southern California with me when I was out here speaking at an event. I brought her along, so she had been here just once. And Evie, our youngest, had not been here at all, had never been to Southern California when we told her that we were moving here. And so you can imagine, when you find out you're moving to a new place, all kinds of questions come to your mind. Where am I going to live? What is my room going to be like? Where will I meet friends? What's the church like? Um, what am I gonna do in a place that is never freezing and raining? And so she had all kinds of questions. And so what I did is I took out my phone and I showed her pictures. I said, hey, here's some houses that we are considering looking at. Um, here's Disneyland. Here, here's the beach. Here's, here's where daddy will like to go mountain biking. Um, here's a school that you could possibly go to. I showed her 
all of these pictures of what life will be like for her on the other side of the move. And for the Christian, moving from this life to the next life is, is gonna be glorious, but this is the life we know. And even if we believe Jesus, that he loves us, is building a place for us, and is going to take us to be with him, we haven't been there yet. And this is, this is what we know. It's not perfect, this world bruises us and hurts us, but it is what we know. So our Heavenly Father is really gracious to give us pictures, pictures of what our everlasting home is going to be like. And if you're honest, there's a deep longing within you for that home, even though, even though you don't know what it's like yet because you haven't been there. G.K. Chesterton, he said this, the modern philosopher had told me again and again that I was in the right place and I still felt depressed. When I heard I was in the wrong place, my soul sang for joy. I knew now why I could feel homesick at home. For the Christian, that's how we feel. We feel homesick at home. So wherever you are now, wherever you're watching from, I mean, this is your home, but deep down you are homesick for your everlasting home, heaven. And we're gonna look at a passage in scripture at the end of the Bible. Revelation 21, second to last chapter in the Bible, and see our Heavenly Father give us some pictures. He's gonna basically say, hey, come see. Let me show you a picture of your everlasting home. Now, a common question that you've asked me during this teaching series has been about loved ones that you have who know Jesus, who have, who have died and have gone to heaven, and you're asking, okay, is what I'm reading about now the place that they are in currently? And so let me give you a real quick answer to that. The scripture teaches that when a believer dies, they immediately go to heaven. So your loved one who knows Jesus immediately after they leave this life, they are in the presence of God. And then when Jesus returns, he is going to have a new heaven and a new earth. And so those in the current heaven will then be in the new heaven and new earth. So what we're gonna read about is the picture of the ending, but surely, there's much similarity between the ending we're about to read and where people who die now, who know Jesus, are in this moment. So I believe this message is gonna be filled with a lot of hope for you. You're gonna see pictures of where you are going. Look with me, Revelation chapter 21, verse 22 through 27. The scripture says, John, who's writing down this revelation from God, says, I did not see a temple in it, because the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it because the glory of God illuminates it and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Its gates will never close by day because it will never be night there. They will bring the glory and honor of the nations into it, nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those written in the Lamb's book of life. This is the word of the Lord. I'm gonna show you four pictures of heaven, four pictures that our Father shows us in this passage. And here's the first, we see that God's presence will be enjoyed. God's presence is enjoyed in heaven. Look with me again at verse 22 and 23. John writes, who's writing down the revelation from Jesus about your everlasting destination. I did not see a temple in it. So I didn't see a temple in heaven because the Lord God, the Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it because the glory of God illuminates it and its lamp is the Lamb. So John is saying in heaven, I don't see a temple Yet earlier in Revelation 22, I'm sorry, early in Revelation 21, John writes that the city of Jerusalem comes down and it's a perfect cube. It's a perfect cube, just as in the Old Testament, when priests would go into the temple, they would meet in the most holy place of the temple, and that was a perfect cube. 
So John is saying to us that the presence of God comes and dwells with humanity in this everlasting paradise. Now, there's two different viewpoints of this Jerusalem coming down from heaven. There's one group of scholars that believe the dimensions described in Revelation 21 are are literal. That's the size of the new city in heaven. And others believe that the emphasis is that it's a cube. And the the writer's essentially saying that all of heaven is the presence of God. But both agree, both scholars agree that heaven is where we are going to to walk with God in his presence, that the presence of God is going to fill the entire cosmos, the heavens and the earth are going to be filled with the presence of God. And just as a priest in the Old Testament got to enjoy God's presence in the most holy place of the temple, the entire earth, the heavens and the earth are filled with the presence of God, his love, his joy, his peace, his patience, his kindness, his goodness, his faithfulness, his gentleness, his self-control, boom, this is gonna be amazing. The presence of God will fill every square inch and we will enjoy him. Now notice in the verse we just read that Jesus, the lamb, is mentioned twice which is really fascinating because this is the second to last chapter in the Bible. And when Jesus returns, he's not the suffering lamb any longer. He's now the conquering king. But still in the second to last chapter of the Bible, we're seeing that Jesus is the lamb. The reason this is there in these verses is because in the Old Testament, priests could only enter into the most holy place by the sacrifices of the lambs on the day as they went into the temple and we are in heaven, we are in his presence only because of the lamb, Jesus, who was sacrificed for our sins. So in heaven, we're gonna constantly be refreshed and reminded of his grace. We're gonna know over and over again that we are in this perfect paradise because of Jesus and what he's done for us. So the centerpiece of heaven here is Jesus. And the reason I want you to know that is because if you get into reading the book of Revelation, as some of you have even during this teaching series, there are so many details that can grab your attention. I mean, there is some language here that can just um, fascinate you. But we must remember as we read the book of Revelation that the focal point is Jesus and the focal point of heaven is Jesus. A couple weeks ago, I took Kay, my wife, out for her birthday, took her to a really nice restaurant. She looked beautiful, she looked stunning. And so she was the focal point of the meal. It's her birthday. But imagine if on her birthday at this nice restaurant, instead of her being the focal point of the meal, if all I did was point out details in the restaurant, dang baby, check out, check out the way that deep dark wood meets the brick. Isn't that awesome? Hey, where do you think they got these tables from? These tables are so legit. What if we got one of these tables at our house on our patio? Man, this is so cool. Hey, look at that painting. I know it's abstract. What do you think it's saying? What do you think the hidden meaning of that painting is? Imagine if I spent the entire two hours at this dinner with my wife focused on all the details and not focused on her. See, that's what I fear that some of us do when we read the book of Revelation. We forget that Jesus is the focal point. He's the focal point of the revelation and he's the focal point of heaven. G.I. Packer wisely said this, whatever else in the Bible catches your eye, do not let it distract you from him. Let's remember that Jesus is the focal point and heaven is heaven because Jesus is there. Heaven is heaven is because we enjoy his presence. So first picture, hey, what's heaven like? My loved one who passed from this life to the next, what's it like? God's presence is being enjoyed. Check out this picture. Second picture I want you to see, the nations are gathered. Pull up, check it out, look at this picture. Heaven is the nations, every tribe, tongue, and nation gathered. Verse 24, we just read, the scripture says, the nations will walk by its light. Earlier in the book of Revelation, a beautiful text describes a scene of heaven. Notice what this verse says. When he took the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. 
Each one had a harp and golden bowls filled with incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slaughtered and you purchased people for God by your blood from every tribe and language and people and nation. You made them a kingdom and priests to our God and they will reign on the earth. The picture of heaven is this beautiful, multicultural, multi-ethnic gathering, people from every single tribe, tongue, and nation. It's gonna be glorious. Heaven is the racist worst nightmare. And so if you have this picture of heaven being with people just like you in this nice little park and you're eating donuts all day, um, you're not gonna like heaven because heaven is not you filled or surrounded with people just like you. You're surrounded with people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. A couple weeks ago, we gathered our staff in the facility for now Mariner's Santa Ana, which opens this weekend. Because of your generosity, new church launching this weekend, Mariner's Santa Ana, second largest city in Orange County, beautiful city, important city. And so we gathered together as a staff and our staff is beautiful in part because we have people from multiple ethnicities, different tribes, tongues, and nations gathered together. There was singing in English and singing in Spanish. There was prayers in other languages from different people's backgrounds in that room. And it was, I mean, I had goosebumps. I started crying. It was a, just a little snapshot, a little appetizer of heaven. Heaven, Christ's presence is enjoyed but we're also gathered together with people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. And the reason that's awesome is it's gonna remind you over and over again of his creativity that he creates the nations. And it's gonna remind you of his love and his grace that pulls us all together. People who are very different from one another, but we are united because the blood of the lamb who was slain for us to rescue people from every single tribe, tongue, and nation. This is really good, isn't it? And so picture number one, God's presence is enjoyed. Picture number two, check it out. The nations are gathered. And picture number three, you're gonna see that the curse is reversed. Look at verse 25 and then verse 27. Verse 25, the scripture says, its gates will never close by day and it will never be night there. And then verse 27, nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false. And so there's no locked gates, there's no closed gates and no locked doors. Closed gates and locked doors are tools that we use to reduce fear. And so those of us who lock our doors and close gates, they're tools in a world that has a curse, in a world that is broken, in a world where there is pain and there is people who take advantage of us, we use gates and locked doors to feel safe and to lower our fear. Now, some of you, you maybe grew up in a place where nobody locked the doors. Maybe you're watching from a place like my in-laws where no one locks the doors. Kay grew up in North Louisiana and they never locked doors to anything, to their home, to their cars. And so I remember when I told Kay's parents, my in-laws, that we were moving to Miami. And I remember how they looked at me and they're like, Miami, you mean Miami, Florida? You mean like CSI Miami? You mean Miami Vice Miami? I mean, that place, you're gonna take our baby girl, see all of Kay's siblings live on the land in North Louisiana. You're taking our baby girl there, it's not safe. And I assured them, no, 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 no. I am gonna take care of your daughter it's gonna be super safe, it's gonna be amazing. And the very first time that they visited, <laughs> this is so crazy that this happened. The very first time they visited, their car was broken into in our front driveway on the very first night. And so they're longing for a place where there's no locked doors and no gates is really a longing for, for heaven, a place where everything is right, a place where there is no fear and there's no reason to lock your door and there's no reason to close your gate. And heaven doesn't have a closed gate because heaven has no fear. 
It's a world that has no curse. There's no curse. The, the world has no brokenness, no pain, no fear. There is no fear of being betrayed in heaven. There is no fear of being disappointed or of disappointing others. There is no fear of failure or of somebody failing you. There is no fear of being abandoned. There's no reason to close the gate because there's no fear in heaven. And yet at the same time in the verses we read, even though the gates are never closed, nothing impure ever enters heaven. Do you notice that beautiful paradox in the passage we read? The gates are always open, yet nothing unclean comes in. Nothing unclean will ever taint the glory and the beauty of heaven. There will be no pandemics in heaven. There will be no anxiety, no depression, no relational trauma. There will be no more pain, no more tears, no more grief. Nothing unclean will ever enter this place. And so when people ask me, hey, I'm going, when I go to heaven, am I going to miss life on earth? When I'm there, am I going to miss it here, the life that I have here? Um, you will not miss it because where you are going is paradise without the curse. You will not miss a single thing about the brokenness of this world. In my late 20s, I used to travel a bunch speaking. This is pre-kids. And so I essentially every week I was on a plane going somewhere to speak. And I flew so much that I, I got this medallion status on airlines and, and got upgraded to first class a bunch of times. And I remember the first time that I got upgraded to first class. I'd never been in first class before. And, and I had got this thing in the mail that I was now medallion. I showed it. I got upgraded to first class. And I was like, what? this was crazy. First class, they, they hand you a warm towel, like right when you sit down to wash your hands. It's not this small little bag of peanuts or pretzels. There's this basket that they pass around with all kinds of candy bars and other things in it. Um, there's so much room. I mean, it's so much room. You can like kick back in first class. And then they shut the curtain, which is essentially saying to the folks in coach, nothing unclean is ever to enter first class. <laughs> and I remember sitting in first class and blown away that I was there and how many times do you think I thought about what life was like back in coach? You think I missed life back in coach on that first time that I flew first class? I mean, was I thinking about, man, I wish so badly I could be in the middle seat next to the bathroom all the way back where the big dude right in front leans back and I can't even put my laptop on my lap. I never thought of coach one time because the upgrade was so amazing and heaven is your everlasting and final perfect upgrade. You will not miss life in a world that is filled with pain and brokenness. And maybe one of the reasons that people have thought we'll miss life here is because we've had a really bad view of heaven given to us. I remember when I was a kid, I asked a Sunday school teacher one time, am I gonna get to play basketball in heaven? And he said, no. Nah. You're not even gonna to wanna to play basketball in heaven. You're just gonna to wanna to worship Jesus all day long. And you know, me as a teenager, I'm thinking, dude, that, that doesn't sound that awesome. I mean, I like what we're doing right here. I like worship services, but all day, 24 seven, all I'm gonna do is sing songs? Didn't sound too awesome to me, to be honest with you. And I'm not the only one. Mark Twain in his very famous work, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, he has Huckleberry Finn say the same thing. This is what Huckleberry Finn, his character says about someone who told him about heaven. He said, she said all a boy would have to do there in heaven was go around all day long with a harp and sing forever and ever. So I didn't think much of it. I didn't think much of it, but that's not what heaven is. Heaven is not you walking around on a harp singing all day. Heaven is the curse reversed meaning you go back to the very first two chapters in the Bible and you see paradise without the curse. So here, here's my viewpoint. Anything that you can see or imagine happening in the first two chapters in the Bible before sin entered the world and tainted everything, before the world was judged 
because of our sin, anything that happened in those first two chapters, this is what heaven will be like. I can't fully understand, no eye can fully understand what, what's in front of us, but you can get a picture of the first two chapters in the scripture of paradise when everything was amazing. When God walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day and they enjoyed his presence, when their relationships were so perfect and they were in perfect harmony with one another and they walked in the garden and they ate amazing fruit from trees that God himself planted for them, when they enjoyed all the activities that they could enjoy in the garden. They worked, they stewarded, they worked the garden. So heaven, just so you know, you will have desires in heaven and they will be gloriously met. You will not have any unmet desires in heaven. You will have relationships with other people in heaven, just like we see in the first two chapters of the Bible. You will work in heaven. You'll work, but you will work in a way, in an unspoiled, untainted world where everything is perfect. And so what will we do in heaven? What kind of work will we do? People have asked me. Uh, here's what I know. Jesus said, if you are faithful with a few things in this life, you'll steward many in the next life. So you're faithful here. You'll steward more there. Maybe some of you, I don't know, I'm just thinking Garden of Eden. Maybe some of you will steward this massive garden of succulents. I mean, the succulents here are awesome, but imagine how beautiful they will be in a new heaven and a new earth when sin hasn't corrupted them and your job will be to maintain this amazing garden of succulents. Maybe some of you will paint or lead a team of painters who are gonna put together art that will be displayed in the new heavens and the new earth. Maybe some of you will lead or steward restaurants where amazing cuisine and food will be served in the new heavens and the new earth. We will have jobs there. We will steward over the new heavens and the new earth and everything will be perfect. So our relationships will be perfect. There'll be no backstabbing, no betrayal, no slander, no gossip. The relationships will be perfect. Our desires will be perfectly met as we walk with God in the cool of the day and we will steward and work and enjoy our work, not by the sweat of our brow after sin entered the world, but in perfect harmony with God and the heavens and the earth that he has created that we get to enjoy with him. It's gonna be awesome. Now, there's some jobs that will not be in heaven. Some jobs won't be there. And so if you have any of the jobs I'm going to list, you're gonna have a job, it's just not gonna be this job. And you be faithful now in your job now because you are giving God's grace in a world that desperately needs God's grace, but there you won't have the same job. There'll be no more titians in heaven, no more titians, because there's no more death in heaven. There will not be doctors in heaven because there will be no diseases to cure, no ailments to fix. I will be able to go mountain biking in heaven, I believe, and see the unspoiled beauty of God's creation. But unlike in this world, when I have gone over the handlebars and broken things, I'm not breaking things in the new heaven and the new earth. So there'll be no doctor to see. There'll be no grief counselors in heaven because there will be no trauma and no grief. There will be no more soldiers in heaven because there will be no wars. There will be no police in heaven because there will be no crime the gates will be open and there'll be no crime. There will be no divorce attorneys in heaven because there will be no relational strife. There will be no IRS agents in heaven because, because it's heaven. I mean, there just won't be any. There just won't be any. The curse is going to be reversed. Last picture I wanna show you. Your body, our bodies are glorified in heaven. The scripture says in Revelation 22 that those who enter heaven are those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And what happens to us is that we get brand new glorified bodies. The apostle Paul wrote this in 1 Corinthians 15. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the splendor of the heavenly bodies is different from that of the earthly ones. 
There is a splendor of the sun, another of the moon, and another of the stars. In fact, one star differs from another star in splendor. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. So you have a body now, but it's not like the glory of the bodies that's to come. Sown in corruption, raised in incorruption. Sown in dishonor, raised in glory. Sown in weakness, raised in power. You are going to receive an everlasting body in heaven. So you're not simply going to be a spirit hovering around on clouds. You're not going to be an angel. So you don't become an angel in heaven. You don't get reincarnated and become a butterfly and fly throughout the different places of the new heavens and the new earth. You get a body. It's a spiritual body, but it's still a body. So what is a a new body? What is a spiritual body? Well, you you can get a sense of it. People have asked like, what age will the body be? Um, I, I do not know the answer to those questions, but here's what I can tell you. When Jesus was resurrected from the dead, he had a resurrected body. He had a resurrected body as he walked on this earth and the disciples recognized him. So you will be recognizable in heaven in this glorified body. So when you are in heaven with loved ones who have passed on before you, you will recognize one another just as the disciples recognized Jesus in his resurrected body. Jesus in his resurrected body was able to touch and be touched. He ate with his disciples and so we in our resurrected new bodies in this everlasting paradise, we will have the five senses. We will see and the sights we see are glorious. We will hear and the sounds we hear are perfect. We will enjoy taste and touch and sense. We will sense things in these new glorified bodies and we will be ourselves. You will be you, I will be me, but without the parts of me that I wish weren't there, without, the shameful parts of me, the sinful parts of me, the parts of me that Jesus is still working on, those parts will not be there. A new glorified body, more splendorous than the earthly body that we have now. Joni Erickson Tata, she said it this way, and God has used her tremendously. She walks with Jesus, teaches the scripture. She suffers greatly and has suffered greatly in this life, in her current body. And she's longing for the day when she has this new glorified body. Here's what she wrote. Somewhere in my broken, paralyzed body is the seed of what I will become. The paralysis makes what I am to become all the more grand. I love it. Oh, it's so beautiful. When you contrast atrophied, useless legs against splendorous, resurrected legs, I'm convinced that if there are mirrors in heaven, and why not? The image I'll see will be unmistakably Joni, although a much better, brighter Joni. So you will be you, but a much brighter, more splendorous, glorified body. These are the pictures of heaven. The presence of God is enjoyed. The nations are gathered. The curse is reversed. And we are in glorified bodies. Now, some of you, and maybe even some of your friends have thought, man, if you teach so much on heaven, you're going to cause us Christians to not care about needs in this world and not care for people in this world, but that's historically not true. The more your heart is excited to be with Jesus forever, actually, the bigger impact you make in this world now. So the scripture teaches us to set our minds on things above, our hearts on things above, where Christ is seated. This is one of the reasons that Christianity really exploded in the first century in Rome. It was an interesting time in the first century in Rome because it wasn't COVID, it wasn't a coronavirus pandemic, but there were multiple plagues that struck Rome in the first century. And Christians going into the first century were the minority by far, but on the other side of these plagues, Christianity exploded. And why did Christianity explode? Rodney Stark is a historian and a sociologist, and he's written about, in his book, The Rise of Christianity, about what happened. Here's what happened. When the pandemics or the plagues hit Rome in the first century, most people fled the city. They didn't know exactly what was causing people to become sick and die, but a third of Rome died. And so they knew 
that it was contagious, whatever it is they were suffering from. So many people fled. They left the cities, except for Christians. Christians stayed in Rome. And just from the mere fact that many people who didn't know Jesus left the city and Christians stayed, the percentage of Christians in Rome increased. And so just from that, there were more Christians, it felt like. But then the Christians who stayed, they did amazing amazing work in the city of Rome. They served meals, they provided medical care, they ran to those who were sick and they cared for them. And so those who did not know Jesus saw the Christians stayed in the city. They stayed in a difficult place and they loved people in the middle of the pain and the brokenness and the messiness of the middle of which we find ourselves right now. And they were blown away by the faith of the Christians and it caused them to hear what the Christians were teaching about Jesus. So Rodney Stark, this sociologist said that both groups really acted in alignment with what they believed. The group who left Rome, who fled, they were living out what they believe, which is, man, this world is all there is. And if this world is all there is, I have to live this one life for myself. I have to make the most of this one life for myself. And so I have to leave here. And so they left. Christians, on the other hand, they also acted in full alignment with what they believe. And what the Christians believed was this world is not all there is. An upgrade is coming. The best is yet to come. And because Jesus has served us, and because this life is not all there is, we're gonna use the one life we have to serve people here in the world that is broken and in desperate need of grace because we are confident that one day we will be with him forever and enjoy his presence forever. See, if you really believe the pictures of heaven, if you really believe that's where you're going, it actually will cause you to make a bigger impact here and now.
So your final destination is perfect, but this world is not. And so in this world, there's pain. And I want you to know that we have people from our church that would love to pray with you. So if you are watching this live on Saturday night, Sunday morning, the chat, we have pastors and people from our prayer team are in there now who would love to pray with you. Or if you're watching this at any time, if you will text prayer to the number on the screen, we'll have people from our prayer team pray for you as you live now in the messy middle of this life. And we wanna pray that God will fill you with his peace and his mercy and his grace and his wisdom if you have decisions. So people from our team are ready to pray for you right now. Will you look, extend your hands? I'll pray a prayer of blessing over you as we go. Father, I pray for your sons and daughters as they live in this world. Remind them that they are yours, that you hold them to yourself. Bless them this new week. Cause your face to shine on them. Fill them with your joy and your peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you, Mariners Church.